Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I've got a really special episode for you today because I'm joined by studio designer Carl Tatz. If you've been in the studio design world for any length of time, you'll probably have heard of Carl and his revolutionary Phantom Focus system. Carl's been at the forefront of studio design for decades, and he's worked with some of the biggest names in the industry. And today he's here to drop some serious knowledge on us, because we're diving into one of the most debated topics in studio acoustics, and that is room treatment versus speaker tuning. Which one really makes the biggest difference to your sound? Is all that foam on your walls really doing the trick? Or should you be focusing on dialing in your speakers perfectly? Carl's going to share his expert insights, practical tips, and maybe even challenge some of the most common advice out there. Whether you're just starting out setting up your home studio or you've been tweaking it for years, you'll want to stick around for this one. Trust me, by the end of this video, you'll have a whole new perspective on how to get the best sound out of your room. But real quick, to help you out on this journey, I've created my home studio treatment framework that you can download for free at the link in the description. These are my five steps to systematically treating a home studio and getting it to translate. So if you're in the process of setting up your new, new studio and you're wondering what steps you actually need to take and in what order, what to focus on and what you can ignore, I really want you to check out my home studio treatment framework. It's a simple step-by-step -step process, very top level that I compiled for you so you know exactly what you need to do to take your room from empty to fully treated and getting it to translate. So it's all in there, how to set up your speakers, how to find your listening position, how to work with porous absorption, how to work with resonance absorption, how measurements come into play, speaker calibration, but also smaller things like speaker decoupling, and then obviously also when to include a subwoofer. It's all in there laid out nicely for you to follow in a step-by-step -step process so you know exactly what to focus on at each step of the way. So if that's you, make sure to download my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. All right, let's jump right in and learn from one of the best in the business. Carl, thanks for joining me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And uh, yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Same here, Jessica. Looking forward to this as well. That's sweet. And the question that I really want to start with, because obviously you're, 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 you're known for the Phantom Focus system. In the, in the context of stereo sound systems, what is the Phantom Center? Um, well, it, it's nothing I invented. It's, it's uh, you know, I think it was first discussed in the 60s when stereo came out. And it's the oral illusion of there being a center speaker when you have a speaker set up correctly, uh, you know, symmetrically, hopefully in a, 30, 60 equilateral triangle uh, will give you the impression that there's actually a, a center speaker there. Um, and usually it's the vocal, it's the most uh, apparent. Um, um, so that's, that, that's what I know. I, I mean, is it, you know, in our, uh, in our, uh, in our surround or Atmos systems, we use a, a, a motorized center stand where the, the center speaker goes up and down because it's disconcerting when the, there's actually a speaker there. It freaks people out because you swear to God that, you know, <laughs> it's that's it's, sound is coming out of that speaker and it's not. So we, we put it down and it just feels better. It's probably acoustically better too because it's open. You know, but. Yeah, absolutely. And I found that it's, yeah, it's it's funny how when, when people first hear a, pop, a proper phantom center, just how real it is just how 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 plastic it sounds or like how yeah just how how uh how comparable it is, compar comparable it is to there being an actual speaker there it's it's really quite yeah. quite quite i mean it's interesting you bring it up i mean that was the inspiration for my whole dog and pony show <laughs> is that you know i had a commercial studio for years 18 years I actually sold to cheryl crow greatest day in my life um <laughs> amazing yeah but um uh it was you know that, that center image i worked so there's a whole history of how it all developed we can get into that if you want um but yeah that center image that's the most impressive thing when you can get that right and um 
it's, it's more than just setting up the speakers correctly. You know, obviously that's that's what we do. You know, when, by the time you we do all our other magic, which isn't magic at all, but um, sure. Um, but but that's I I just came up with that name. I think maybe as a joke at first. Um, I said, well, that works. You know, <laughs> yeah, sounds cool. It sounds cool. That's all. Yeah, yeah, people, and it's and it's intriguing, right? People are like, whoa, 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 what is this? Yeah, it's yeah, it's intriguing if it's like, if it's not confusing, you know. So I, I wonder, if, I always wonder, maybe I should have called it something else. Um, but I think it's a good name. Okay, well, good, thank you. And then, I mean, I, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but like it's, it's definitely also an inspiration for a very simple speaker setup procedure that I developed basically just based on hearing has absolutely nothing to do with the phantom focus system, but I call it the phantom speaker test yeah, because it is based, based around basically yeah. messing with the speakers until you get a proper phantom center, because that is a, a sign that you have proper stereo. Well, it's one of the main signs, right? Well, it's the, the, you know, you've seen on the web or you may have seen it on my website, the null positioning ensemble. Sure. Yeah. That's like basically the Bible, you know, okay. if, if you can do that, you've got your imaging. You don't yeah. necessarily have frequency response, but you've got the imaging. And yeah, that's absolutely. what I've had people, engineers or, or students at a lecture or something, you know, contact me and say, oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, and it's, you know, again, I didn't invent this. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like I'm doing what I what I was told to do, you know, by by the gurus of in the back in the 60s, you know, they figured it out. I mean, well, I think this is uh, was a good it's a good transition to my kind of second question, very adjacent, which is when I uh, when I did a video recently on what stereo is, and I did some research on when it was invented, it very quickly became clear to me that there is, well, there is no proper definition of what stereo is. I mean, we now say yes, two speakers equilateral triangle, all this stuff. But there is no kind of, there is no standard that was once written, at least as that I could find, that says this is what stereo is. Maybe you could talk about that. Um, I don't know that much about the history. It started basically in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with all the speakers like uh, A.R. and Scott and, and uh, those speakers and those guys. One guy in particular, um, um, Roy Allison, he's the mm -hmm. one who uh, discovered that when you put speakers on a stand, which is what we do all the time, you know, for near field monitoring, there's a cancellation, there's a floor bounce, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a huge dip at about 120 hertz, give or take, you know, and nobody talks about this. And I thought, how come nobody talks about this? You know, it's, it's just, oh, I mean, there's no exceptions. You see it all the time. Occasionally, you'll see it maybe a little lower in, in a really huge room sometimes. <clears throat> but that's the single reason why everybody has a problem with the low end, because they're not hearing it uh, because of that cancellation. And the only way you, you can't EQ it because uh, it's too much. You know, you can, but you'd have to listen to 30 dB or something. Yeah, you, you, know, yeah. you just kill your headroom. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, so the only way to do that is with subwoofers, you know, proper crossover, et cetera. Um, so there was a, a guy who sent me a link to this article on Roy Allison, who discovered that whole thing. And up until that point, you know, it's called the Allison effect. But up until that point, I thought it was the TAS effect because nobody okay. talked. About it. it was such a relief to have it verified. Like, oh, I'm not the only one who, who talks about this because speaker manufacturers don't want to talk about it. You know, yeah. you never hear, it, you know, and, yeah. and uh, auto correction and things can only go so far with that because of what we just talked about. Even if they use subwoofers, they, they don't, you know, it's not hands on. Like what we don't we have did. endless headroom. Yeah. 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 Um, the next thing that I'm really curious about, which is where the well, the phantom focus system and your approach kind of fits into the, the history of control room design. Right. So we've had this this whole well, over the last, what, maybe 60, 70, 80 years, we've had so many different approaches to control room design, starting off with live and dead end, uh, reflection free zone, uh, controlled image design, non environment, uh, front to back, uh, which is the, the Northwood acoustics approach these days. Um, 
knowing all of this, seeing all of this, kind of which of those makes the most sense to you and why? I don't think there's an answer. You know, I think uh, all of them work one way or the other. <clears throat> I think there may be some confusion or misleading that you can design a control room you know with acoustic treatment and think you're going to have a frequency response like like we have with the phantom focus system it's impossible yeah you know, maybe nasa could do it you know yeah. but uh <laughs> realistically uh it ain't going to happen i mean our you know comparatively speaking our studios our mix rooms suck you know without the phantom focus system and we we do it in other mix rooms also but you know it, it's we've done so many it's it's uh it's all very familiar we never we don't get surprised very often um so the main thing is the sweet spot you know that that's what you're talking about you want that to be god the god spot which you can do with you know processing um and people say oh you can't do that you know it'll affect the rest of the room blah 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 well if you're mixing, you know, over on the side or on back on a couch someplace, you need to find a different profession. You know, you want to be in that sweet spot. That that's where the where you want to be. That said, you know, in in a, an actual studio design, most of our rooms are small, so the the modes are going to be stronger than in a, in a really large room. Um, okay, you like that? Um, you know, you want you know we do things to ameliorate you know the the consequences of the modes so that it's not extreme you're always going to have somewhat of a bump on the back wall you know uh, like you know it, typically you'll have a couch there so if you pull out the couch out a little bit you know it'll go away you'll get away from that yeah. um and, and as you walk around again a small room there's going to be places where it's going to be boomier than the other it's my biggest fear is like i don't want this to be terrible you know yeah. um <laughs> So, so that's why I do the things I do. Um, so it sounds nice in, in the room, um, but it sounds what I say to people when I give uh, someone a demonstration. It's like when you sit in the seat, you're in an, another room. This has nothing to do with the rest of the room. And, you know, it might sound great. Oh, that sounds great. But when you sit in that seat, it's like, oh, my God, you know, and, and that's that's the whole that's what gets me out of bed. That's the, the whole impetus for me. I go through months of agony, you know, sometimes with these uh, studios, but the, the moment when the client sits in uh, that seat, you know, and I see the look on his face or he'll swing around and look at me. That's what it's all about. Yeah, uh, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can you give me a, a kind of a, an overview of like uh, the phantom focus system and how that well, how that works and how that relates to the room as well? Um, well, I mean, we do acoustic treatment of the room. We have, you know, like you can see in the, in the photos that, you know, we'll have the front corners, um, are basically base traps, uh, with the subwoofers underneath, um, <clears throat> so that with a big, thick uh, membrane, so it doesn't go up into the, into the sub, um, you know, okay. we want the sound to go out, um, but they're just freestanding. Uh, I mean, there's so much to talk here, but um you know the subwoofers we place either facing a wall or facing down down firing okay. um because if you if they face out they might look better if they're going to be visible but just keep in mind that the sound comes out and then wraps around and cancels mm -hmm. the wall that's why if you face it to the wall you get the biggest piece of meat it's very obvious i mean you can try it yourself uh you'll hear the difference um, so that's one thing we do with that. And then the, the back wall is all, we'll do various types of um, what we call axle mode absorb, absorption uh, that goes down to 20 or 30, depending on what we're doing. And um, that's using resonance absorption as well, or is this all porous absorption? Like, um... uh, no, that's resonance. Um, yeah. it, it's a, um, you know, a plywood, basically a sealed kind of thing. And then in front of that, we'll do, you know, typical wide band, either two inch or four inch panels. Um, but I'm, I'm a much bigger fan of um, wide band absorption. But for something that low, you're not going to get it if you don't try, you know, with uh, with the um, resonant thing. 
yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to make it deep enough with the wide band. Yeah. Um, and, and the efficiency um, also drops. I mean, like, I guess you could technically do it, but you'd need depths for like 20, 30 oh, hertz that are just un so really unpractical good. that they are basically not, not possible. Yeah, well, there's some guy, I haven't seen much of him. There's some guy who had like these little thin things he put on the wall and he swore that that was controlling that stuff. Yeah, he, he had his whole show going on. It's like, okay, whatever. Yeah, um, I think the, the reality that many people or that it's uh, is hard to accept is just how much space you need to use for mm -hmm. low end absorption if you want to actually get it right. I mean, that's that's a kind yeah. of reality we can't get around, right? And, and that's fine because again, it's about the sweet spot. You know, it's, it's yeah. I tell clients don't expect perfection. Um, you can't afford perfection. You don't have a footprint for perfection, and even if you did, it's not going to be perfect. Yeah, you know, uh, but. Getting back to your question, so so I, that's my general thing, you know, make the the, um, the ceiling absorptive, the back wall absorptive, uh, the sides we use the acoustic lens and they're yeah. absorptive columns. So the lens is that the idea is that the, the speaker, the sound of the speakers, you know, aims toward those walls and it brushes against that lens and it kind of catches it. Uh, okay. So it's a combination of and we use mirrors or, you know, if it's a window, but we try, we go for visual symmetry also. Mm -hmm. um, so that, um, you know, it's a, the acoustic lens is, is absorptive, diffusive, and reflective in combination thereof. Okay. Um, what What's the effect on the, on the kind of the perception of the stereo image? Well, you're just defeating the, you know, the first reflections with it. That, that's the idea. And I think, you know, if you just made it, you know, totally absorptive, then it's not going to be as open sounding, you know, mm -hmm. where your ears are, you don't want it absorptive, you know, you want some kind of diffusion or absorption diffusion, there. ideally, you know, it just feels more open. And again, again, with the mirrors, it's amazing, you know, you'll have a room that might be, you know, 12 feet wide. And as soon as you put the mirrors up, it, it feels like, oh, you know, it's, it's amazing what it does. And people say, well, the mirrors, I mean, they're very reflective. They're not much more reflective than drywall, you know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it, again, you know, but when we put the mirrors up, you know, you know, you clap your hands. I mean, uh, the um, um, the flutter echo is, you know, insane, of course. Um, but as soon as you put those columns up, which are about typically about a foot apart, you yeah. know, it, like it disappears. Yeah. It's amazing. And yeah. it's a simple thing like that. And it's basically uh, I'm I'm gonna see if I can find a picture to to throw in at this point as well. But it's basically a kind of a uh, it's kind of columns mixing absorption and reflection over maybe what four to six feet or something like that. Is that right? It's more like eight feet. Yeah, but then or, it's, it's or... typically like a, a foot of absorption and then a kind of a a foot of reflection, which is the mirror or eight, something like eight, that, right? Eight inches. The the columns are eight inches wide. And eight then inches. Like a... mm -hmm. Yeah, and then a foot. Sometimes it's wider. I mean, we do it 14 inches. It still works. Um, but it's anywhere from 8 to 10 feet long, you know. Right, um, yeah. If there's a window, you know, we try and get the biggest window we can if we're going to have a window. Yeah. Because um, it just feels better. So then we just match it with a mirror thing on the other side. Um, and I think that's so, one one of the reasons why your rooms also look so similar, right? I mean, I was going to mention that anyway. If you look at the the projects on your website, uh, the rooms look close to identical. And at first, you might be thinking, "Oh, well, this is the same room," but it turns out, no, no, no. There's a this isn't. These are all different rooms, but there's a reason why they all look the same, right? Yeah. No, I mean, you you really hit on it. Um, is in back to what we you and I were discussing before you started the video is that. You know, I used to, you know, reinvent the wheel every time I did a studio. And finally, I just came up with this formula that was repeatable yeah. um, and worked. So basically, I'm selling Teslas with options, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, and uh, you know, my clients will will uh, come up with ideas. And uh, like the stone you see on the, on the front of a lot of my... Uh, Rooms that came up, that was a client's idea. And I said, well, gee, yeah. I don't know, you know, and now it's, 
people like demand it, you know, you know, or not, not, not everybody, but, um, so I like it when somebody throws, throws me a curve and, you know, adds, adds something to it. But basically, you know, people, I don't have any competition. At least I present myself that way. Um, in that, you know, go to the website. If you like the way those look, then I'm your guy. But if you want something else, I'm not your guy. If you, in other words, if you want, if you want a Tesla, yeah, I sell go buy Tesla. A Tesla. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if you want a Mercedes or a Ferrari, you need to go to, a, you know, or a Ford, right. whatever, you know, you need to go to those guys. This is what I, and that's what I want to do. You know, I'll, I've turned down stuff because this, I'm just at the point where I'm just old and cranky and I, <laughs> that's what, <laughs> this is what I want to do because it, you know, it, it really worked. We got a thousand of it, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think again, also this, just to kind of mention this, I think this is one one thing that many people uh, overestimate. We are working in a in a niche of a niche when we're talking about control room design specifically, right? And there, this is such a small niche. There is a hand. Well, in com in comparison to other kind of uh, industries, there's a handful of people working on this, and many times the solutions that we offer are things that we as a single person developed from our experience. And like you said, you do it this way because you know this is this is something that's repeatable and it works, right? And people want something that works. And so you need to be able to, to do that. And this is this is the way that you found that works. And um, and maybe another designer found a different way that works for him and it might very kind of subtleties might vary in some instances it might vary uh, a bit quite a bit on certain aspects uh, but most designers do one thing and that's it <laughs> yeah right? because that's can, that's what they know how to do right you can usually pick them out you know i mean i, I can recognize somebody's work right away because it's sure that's you know exactly yeah um can you talk to me a bit about like how uh, how your your approach evolved when how i mean you already mentioned that you you kind of you 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 reinvented the wheel every time at the beginning can you talk to me about kind of the beginning days what kind of things did you try back then that didn't work when did the first kind of things start falling into place how did how did your approach evolve to where we are now it started in my parents living room when they would go Excellent. out my friends would come out from over uh, my father had some Scott speakers, which were a big deal. So we put one, it was to us, you know, a huge speaker at that time. I think they had a 10 inch woofer, <clears throat> put one on top of the piano, and then we turned the uh, piano bench upright and put that over there. So they were high. We'd get stoned and listen to Led Zeppelin. Sweet. <laughs> or uh, um, Simon and Garfunkel, Uncle or Naz, <clears throat> you know, and that's. That was my inspiration. You know, speakers were always like my thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jumping ahead quite a bit. Um, you know, I had a commercial studio for 18 years. So it kind of the Phantom Focus system kind of started there. It wasn't the Phantom Focus system, but I had, uh, I went through, you know, various um, sta stages where at one point I got a pair of like, uh, Dynodio M3 monitors, big monitors, mm -hmm. and I knew they'd have to be tuned. So I brought someone in who is um, famous for that, and um, he did it, and I wasn't particularly happy with it. So I started fooling with, you know, the angle and, and stuff like that, and then I had him back. And basically, I had one cut that we went over and over again, I said, and I knew how it how I wanted it to sound, and I just kept telling him what to do because he had the software. So at that point, I realized, you know, basically I tune this thing, but I need to learn some sort of, you know, analyzing software to do this. So that's how it started. When was um, this? When? Yeah. Um, well, I still had the studio, so probably about 2000. Uh, 1999, okay. yeah, okay. somewhere. So no, no room EQ wizard. Uh, I guess smart probably wasn't a thing yet. Maybe they were just uh, around the corner. Yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, this was Meyer. 
Yeah, Meyer like Sound, yeah. Old Meyer uh, analog EQ. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's what he used at the time. That's what I started using. Then realized, you know, quickly, you know, all analog EQs for boat anchors, you know. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Basically useless. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, now it's so powerful. And we're about to make. I'm investigating making another leap here. Uh -huh, interesting. Which I don't really want to talk about. You know, okay, fair enough. Okay, fair yeah. enough. We'll see. We'll see what that is when it, when yeah. when it happens. Yeah, might just be a hop. I don't know if it's a leap in it, but we'll see. Okay. Well, I'm excited and looking forward to it. Um, yeah. When one of the questions that I keep getting, and that is really hard to answer, more than anything in this kind of the home studio space, right? People obviously converting their spare bedrooms, basements, gar garages, whatever, into studios. And they ask me, and they do something, they do some some type of treatment, and then they ask me, is this enough? Am I done? And I found that is a really difficult question to answer. How would you answer that question? It's like, when when are we done with treatment? Um, well, I think there's a formula for that. Um... That, Interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can't think what it is offhand. Um, you know, I, I have a company called Oralex who custom make uh, modules for me. But I think it's something like 50% of the room should be acoustically treated. Uh, of course, that doesn't distinguish whether it's, you know, low end or, you know, mid band. So, my, yeah, my thought is that you don't want to sit in the listening position, clap your hands and hear the room, you know, so, so I think you should err on too dead and too live because yeah. anything that comes back to you obviously is going to cause comb filtering. Yeah. Uh, so like if you go into a room, I mean, my example is uh, an empty swimming pool. You can learn to mix in an empty swimming pool. Eventually your mind ear will figure it out. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not desirable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, the, and your speakers will sound, even if they're near field and they're right in front of you, they're going to sound like they're 10 feet away because of all the uh, comb filter that happens with the reflections. So you just want to calm the room down. Um, you know, low end, again, you know, it's, you know, the corners are a good suspect, you know, the upper look you have, the, what we call soffit panels, uh, get that. But, but it's, you know, for, if we didn't, people didn't have windows and it wasn't an aesthetic thing, It'd be nice to do um, some sort of wideband absorption on the side. There's some sophisticated ways of doing that, but it wouldn't wouldn't look that good. Would yeah. you know? It, you know, and the aesthetic is super important. You know, you want to go in there every day and say, "Oh my God, I can't believe this is mine." You know, that that kind of thing. So there's there's compromises for everything. Um, but to answer your question, you know, the obvious things: grab the first reflections and. As you mentioned, the ceiling is just another wall. You, you, you want to grab all your first reflections at first. You know, do your corners, but you know, four inch, 703 or rock wall, whatever you're going to do across the, the corners. If you can do the south of things and, and you, you want a cloud, you know, you want the ceiling to be dead, you know, and just do some sort of, uh, you know, grab the first reflections. You know, and, and the whole mirror thing, and everybody knows about that. You run the mirror along the side of the wall. It's a great way to do it. And then, uh, you know, don't have it totally absorbed of where your ear is. Um, that's not where the first reflections are anyway. Um, so just maybe do a little, or you can just put some open spaces where your panels are. In other words, you could do very well just putting panels all, all over the place. Um, but the bottom line is, as part of the answer to this, is like what you really care about is one position mm -hmm. you know is a sweet spot you know ultimately that's it that's where you're going to make your decisions you know um and and that's that's a great gift you know you don't have to get that freaked out you don't tune rooms you know you tune speakers sure um you know so if, if you can get that sweet spot happening and and using the null positioning ensemble is a great opportunity and also the um you know, that axle mode calculator that's on my website also. So it's a really dumb, simple visual one. It's my favorite one. Uh, you know, I'll put a link to it under the video for people to check out. I mean, any in any case, uh, uh, your website will be linked under the video, and I'll put links to everything that we talk about in the, in the description as well. 
Um, yeah, I think that's valuable. Uh, and it, it's it's going to get you, you know, toward, toward what it can be. It's not going to be a mental focus system, but it's going to be good. So, and what I tell people, you know, use one of these inexpensive or, um, you know, like derived, not derived, it's, it's really complicated. Direct. Direct, right, very complicated. I very found. complicated, yeah. <laughs> what's you know by the time you do that, uh, what, what's the other the very popular one? Well, well Sona yeah. works. Sound ID. That's the one that everybody uses oh, in yeah, studio. Yeah. yeah, you're probably using it. Um, I, I, I'm yeah. actually doing it manually through my interface, but uh, all the EQ okay. stuff. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But a lot of people do. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I you know if, if you have the opportunity to do it or, or the the knowledge to do it correctly you know as good as you can it's better than nothing you know uh and then there's the more expensive ones by the time you go that far you should hire us you know because it's you know we're going to come you, to you we'll do it for I mean, you for, for people who are thinking about that like what are kind of the limits uh, in terms of for example room size uh space in terms of speakers uh, what are what are the kind of the limits to uh, where you say yes, we can do this, uh, or no, this is this is not going to work. Um, it usually works. You know, we, we do them in bedrooms. They're just certain criteria. Again, what we just talked about: first reflections, back wall, some sort of cloud. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and and the way it works is the the first dialogue we have is, you know, once it seems like, you know, they want to do it is they'll send me photos uh and maybe maybe a drawing of the, the room dimensions hopefully it's a rectangle um and uh i'll just pick out well it, it, i mean this we worked a lot of different ways if somebody just wants to do a phantom focus system you know then i, I just see what it is you know obviously if, if it's a full-blown phantom focus mix room that's construction it's a much much more expensive much bigger deal um so I don't need to surprisingly I don't need to know as much if it's somebody somebody's existing room like it was your room you would send me you know you know what the room what's going on there and I would I would say well that that's all cool you know look, but on the front like for instance I don't know what your front wall looks like but it's a big window <laughs> but you know we want the front corners to be available for the subwoofers because my whole subwoofer thing. Okay, so I'll give you my subwoofer. Please. Ring. <clears throat> okay, so if you hang a subwoofer from the ceiling in the middle of the room, that's a full space. So you get 100 watts, and let's just say you're getting 100 dB out of it. Okay, you drop it to the floor, suddenly you're in the half space. You've effectively doubled, you know what I'm talking about. Sure, You've yeah. doubled your, instead of having a 100 watt amp, you now have a 200 watt you know, virtual 200 watt amp with 103 dB. Which is basically the, the boundary effect. Yeah. Front wall, it's now in a quarter space. Mm -hmm. um, doubled again. So now you have a 400 watt virtual amp and 160 dB. And you put in the speaker and one in the corner, you're in an eighth space and you got a 800, virtual 800 watts and 109 dB. So we always use two subwoofers in the corners. Um, because obviously for headroom reasons, but by when you do that, you have it will cancel out the first and third axle null, mm -hmm. uh, become out of phase with each other. The subwoofer the, is actually the, the the side for like side wall or side to side axial mode, right? That's the one you're talking yes. about. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the most important thing because everybody wants to be in the middle of the room, mm -hmm. uh, which is the worst place you can be. So from a, that from helps. a from a mode perspective, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and but everybody wants obviously want to be there because of the symmetry. symmetry. Yeah. yeah. So it's a beautiful thing that you can you can get that for free, but by, by using two subwoofers. Now that's that's the ideal. That said, if you put one sub, if you only have one subwoofer, you put it in the middle of the room, and it's going to go like this to each corner anyway. So you're going to get some of that effect, or you have no subwoofer at all. The left speaker is going to react to the left corner. The right speaker is going to react. So you're going to have some of that attenuation. It's not going to go up like this, but you know, otherwise people wouldn't be able to work at all. But that isn't the uh, the uh, Allison effect. That's a different different dip. How how dependent is this on the the actual 
materials of the walls because obviously we're when we're look when we're thinking about this cancellation happening between uh two subwoofers we need the symmetry in the response to be pretty much identical as well right so the left subwoofer needs to kind of see the same the the, the mirrored space of the right subwoofer and if one wall for example is drywall and the other is brick or concrete and that uh and then that then that symmetry is is off right and like uh, what what, what how, kind of what would you say there well you know ideally you know they should be the same but uh in an existing you know space it may not be hopefully it's not a brick wall at least there's something in front of it but uh sure. <laughs> and, and sometimes uh so so what we do is when we do the tuning we'll we'll shoot each speaker we don't tune each speaker separately. We just look at the um, the level, get the levels the same. You mm -hmm. know? I mean, you could tune them separately. It would require you know an extra channel to, to do that on on the processor. So you get you get them both. Oh, look at that! They're both perfectly. We've got them superimposed on, on the smart screen. Uh, but then when you mono it, it just goes to hell. You mm -hmm. know, so we just tune them as a pair. You know, so this one might be doing as long as we get the levels, the overall level the same. You know, so we'll adjust that. That's the first thing we do. We get the levels the same, and then tune it as if it's one subwoofer. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, that that's okay. the way we do that. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk about like front wall versus back wall. That's one of the things that I get asked a lot, right? I mean, I always say to some extent. Well, look, it's in the end, they're all surfaces. They all kind of do the same thing. Yes, depending on where your speakers are exactly, they might react slightly differently because of the distances to the to the speaker. But from a control room treatment perspective, how, what are the differences between treating the front wall versus treating the back wall? Well, I think if, if you make the whole front wall absorptive, it's going to deaden you know, it's gonna you're gonna suck the energy out of the, the monitors. Okay. Um, that's why you know it's good to have. You know, we have a lot of absorption in the corners. Although sometimes we make we we have less absorption. We might look like it's huge absorption, but we might actually put a barrier behind it, so it's not as absorptive. Okay. Um, um, but the back room, the back of the room, you want it as absorptive as possible. You just want the sound to go like this. And you don't want it to come back to you. You're not yeah. looking for ambience or diffusion in a, in a mix room. In, in a tracking room, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of flexibility. And the tracking room is so much easier because it can be crazy. You know, you can just do whatever you want. You, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. 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 It's, it's I mean, it's open. a complete taste thing, right? I mean, control yeah. uh, re recording room does it, acoustics is is whatever you want, right? It's like, it's how do you want it to sound, yeah. obviously. Yeah, it's either going to be too live or too dead. So, you know, we always shoot for neutral, you know, or if you want something live, depending on the size, you know, you could have a little bit liver by putting the drums in this place instead of this place, that kind of thing, you know. But the control room's much more serious, you know. It needs to be so ideally symmetrical, um, and and as I said, on the dead side, mm -hmm. air, yeah. air, on, air on dead rather than alive. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, like you said before, any anything that comes back to your ear on top of what the speakers are are doing or the, the direct sound from the speakers is going to be is going to cause some sort of interference, comb filter, some sort of distortion, and ultimately we want to hear the speakers and that's kind of the best that that's as good as it's going to get right i mean the the more speaker we hear it's a very yeah, simple equation a kind of a, line from the speaker ideally yeah you know it can be extremes like i say if you put four inches everywhere you know it would sound it would work you know it, it's better than you know the opposite but um it would start to become uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 totally. One of the things that I, I've kind of been thinking about a lot and kind of on a very top level perspective is what's the what's the role of the the actual room in this, right? So we, we kind of already said, okay, the, 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 the closer we get to just hearing the direct sound from the speakers from a 
engineering mixing perspective, the, the, the better it is. But then we don't want to sit in an anechoic chamber with our speakers either, right? So there is, there is a, uh, the, the room does play a role, but it is more, the more I think about this, it's more about just your perception of being in the room rather than its effect on the speakers, right? Well, I think just to reiterate, you want you want some kind of reflection. You want some live liveness on the front of the room, you know. And I, you know, I don't know whether it's live and dead end, whatever. You know, I I don't have an answer for what I do, and it, it is what it is. <laughs> but something like that. Um, but but when you know, in in a phantom focus system, the room disappears because right. you're you're inside the apex of the sweet spot. So not only does the room disappear, uh, the speakers disappear. Mm -hmm. It's just you're hearing the source. You know, wh mm -hmm. whatever you're through it, you're hearing the source. You don't hear the speakers. This, and whatever you run through it um, sounds drastically different. It never sounds like the speakers, whether it's our speakers or somebody else's speakers. It never sounds like the speakers. Um, that's the goal. And, and that's because of the tuning, you know, mm -hmm. the way that's that's the goal that's the magic of it it's not magic all this is physics sure one thing one thing talking about this because one thing i've noticed in your in the in the projects that you posted and i guess this is part of your design is that you don't soffit mount speakers they're always on stands is that correct or or did you no, ever experiment with soffit mounting or like what's your what's your take on soffit mounting versus it's, it's, standing speakers it's couple on the website <clears throat> and the, the reason that um yeah, there's a few that are south south at Mountain. Okay, but I I think if it's a <clears throat> if it's a small room and we're talking near film monitoring, you don't have the luxury. You need to soft at Mountain because you don't have enough space for the for the stands. You know, like you mm -hmm. could look at this called the cockpit. A very small room. It's a the front wall was four feet high. Front wall, four feet, then, four feet, and then uh, it was seven and a half feet wide and nine feet deep okay. it did have did have openings at the back back the back side walls um so there was no room to put stands in there like our phantom focus sound anchor stands they're not gonna by the time you do that you know you'd be outside um um you know i mean obviously softening has a certain advantage um I mean, there. I mean, it, it's it's a necessity. We we haven't had to do that in a while, if I can think of. Um, <clears throat> and then you know we've done it with big monitors too. Um, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's like some people think it just sounds better and not soft at You know, mm -hmm. I, I think one thing I don't like is when I'll see a picture. I saw one recently. They had some big monitors and they had them sort of like in a. Uh, uh, an alcove, a, like it was just a cutout in a wall. It was like a soffit monitor, but it was just like in a shelf with, mm -hmm. you know, space around it. <clears throat> and that's that's not a great idea. If you're going to do it, you need to fill it all the way around because the sound will yeah. come out and you're getting distortion. But who knows? Maybe it sounds fantastic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it was open to, maybe they did that and they decided that sounded better. You know, I don't know. Yeah, and another thing I've noticed is that one thing that helps is if you take, if it's soffit mounted, not to have them flush, have them stick out like a couple of inches. Oh, yeah? That okay. sounds, sounds better. I can't tell you why. Interesting. All but right. We got, there was one up in Aspen. Uh, again, we didn't design the studio. It was a nice studio. But um, we did a, a, a Phantom Focus near, well, we did a, a, a dual into a dual phantom focus system where the, the mains and the near fields share the same low end. Okay. Um, but we noticed that they were flush. And I said, you know, these are going to sound better if we bring them out. And they did. Mm -hmm. and we brought them, uh, which is a real pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> is why I don't recommend people do soft mounting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, no. But I mean, the near field monitoring, it, it just, it's, they breathe more. You know, they just... Yeah. You don't want to do it unless you have to, I yeah, think, yeah. Yeah. for that. Um, talking about the other calculator on your website, uh, the, uh, the um, 
the room mode calculator, I guess, uh, is that what you call mm -hmm. it as well? How, how, yeah. how important do you think room ratios, having good room ratios is to the final result? I mean, there's a lot of debate about that. I obviously have my opinion, but what's, what's your opinion about this? Well, my mentor, or at least one of my mentors, my main mentor is Dr. Floyd Toole. Sure. Who, uh, who is an interesting story. I mean, I kind of got into this when I closed the studio. I didn't know who I was. Like after 18 mm -hmm. years, yeah. you know, that was my identity, sure. recording art. You know, so what am I going to do? Oh, my God. So I went up to Cedia up in um, Indiana at the time. And, <clears throat> you know, it's a huge consumer home theater kind of thing. I, I thought I was going to kill on home theater. And I've done a few, but... <clears throat> They just don't do them in Nashville the way I want to do them. It's 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 a different animal, so I haven't done that many of them, but I'd like to. <clears throat> but um, with that question, I immediately thought of Dr. Floyd Tool because he thinks it's bullshit. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter based on if you calculate, you know, the, the nodes in the room and you and you place people and speakers where they're supposed to be. It doesn't matter. You know, obviously you have to have acoustic treatment. <clears throat> But I, I use it, I use it just as a, uh, a security blanket of some sort. Uh, I'll, I'll look at, and I'll just see, well, okay, this is what's happening here. Again, all these uh, room modes are, are based on concrete bunkers, which nobody has, you know. Um, who the hell knows what these walls are doing? Even the ones I build, you know, they're pretty rigid, but who knows, you know, how they're flexing or, you know. So it, it's never absolute. Um, so so I, I, I will use, um, I, I've used the um, RPG has one. Mm -hmm. And then the one, you, you use one yeah. too. And I, and I, I keep using I, this one called Amrock. Yeah, I've, 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 I've done that and I, and I compare and contrast and they don't always agree, you know. Like, really? Oh, I'd yeah. have to do that. I'd have to check that out. That's interesting. Yeah. Because the yeah. math isn't too difficult. I mean, should be should be the same. Yeah. Um, but or maybe I'm just not using it right. Um, but but I look at that, and then I, I'll look at the axle mode calculator, so I'll, I'll know where things are. I'm probably relying on that. You know, once the room is built, and I'll I'll try. And the question is like, all right, so if I'm build if I'm going to build a uh, axle mode uh, absorber in the back of the room, does that do I calculate it by that or do I calculate it by the real wall behind it? Mm -hmm. You know, this is pretty solid. I usually do that at the real world behind it. Yeah. Um, um, <clears throat> so I use it and I, and I kind of blur my eyes and kind of use the magic wand. And they say, yeah, this is going to be perfect. <laughs> um, the thing is, the panel focus system is so powerful. You know, um, it, it kind of, it, you know, it, it, the... The, the satellite, the, the the speakers are rolled off very high. They're okay. rolled off 120, you know, where the the, the old um, um, THX spec was 80 hertz. You know, it's, well, just, uh, it's high because that's where the uh, Allison effect take, takes place. Your sure. speakers, mm -hmm. again, it could be 100, it could be 110, you know, whatever, uh, 130 sometimes. But, you know, they're dying, so you're not hearing it. it at that point you know so the, it's already crossing itself over you know so that's why we choose that's where we want to fill it in so if you do it at 80 hertz you should have this huge dip at 120 you know so that's that's the whole thing that people don't realize that now you might have low end you might say oh listen to that kick and bass but you're missing this whole valley of miss of information that's not there so sure. You know, and you, this is on my, on the website, you know, you, you mix and say, oh, yeah, that's kicking, you know, and then you take it out to the car. It's like, whoa, I got way too much low end. So you have to come back in because you haven't heard that thing, you know, with, with the car speakers, you're hearing it. So you come back in. So you have to ration yourself like, hey, that sounds great. I better turn it down, you know, which is sad. Um, so that's that's what the and focus thing alleviates because all there's no more dips there's no more peaks you know within reason you know sure. it's you always dreamed you know you, you could hear well listen carl it's uh, amazing stuff like we've covered quite a bit already 
Um, before we wrap up, there's kind of one final topic that I'd like to talk to you about, and that is how do you feel about Atmos? I mean, you, you do Atmos rooms as well, installations as well. Um, what are you seeing from your side where this is going? Is Atmos here to stay? Uh, how do you feel about treating Atmos rooms? Is it, is it, what, what, are there any major differences to kind of treating a, st a stereo room? Can you talk to me about well, that? Yeah. Um, well, they say it's here to stay. You know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of manufacturer driven yeah. you know, between, between uh, Apple and um, Dolby. And, you know, and of course the manufacturers want to sell lots of all the gear. And, um, you know, on, on the one hand, it's, it, you know, people aren't even going to hear it unless they have, you know, go to the trouble of putting up that many speakers in their room. But, you know, it's hard to, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know how to set up two speakers, never mind 13. That's um, the thing, yeah. You know, so, so in some ways it's like 5.1, only worse. Because <laughs> um, I was an early adopter when I had the studio, I was an early adopter of uh, 5.1. Okay. <laughs> and, and I've got lots of stories along those lines, but... Um, um so there's that end of it you know they're not going to hear it you know with ear pods you're not going to hear that's you know what they call spatial or you know it, it's it's not dolby i mean it's not atmos at least not yet you know whatever um <clears throat> so there's that end of it to answer the other question i don't treat it any differently than the stereo room yeah um um it's just a phantom focus there actually is a phantom focus atmos you know, uh, protocol sure. where <laughs> instead of aiming all the speakers right toward the listener, we do what we do with the two channel <clears throat> is we put the apex in back of the, you know, we shoot to the apex and, and the uh, listener is one foot in front of that uh, and six inches in front of the console. So it's 18 inches from the front of the console to the SNL position ensemble. Well, <clears throat> we do the same thing with the rears. So they're aimed a foot in front. Uh, and the overheads, uh, the rear overheads are aimed to a foot in front. And the, the front overheads uh, are, you know, just like that. So you, it, it has that phantom focus uh, imaging thing happening. So it's a, it's a little different. So it's uh, more work. We've got one coming up in LA that um, just trying, you know, we've done several now, but we, you know, it evolves and we keep trying to do it better and easier, mainly, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But and so it's, in, in reality, it's it's more about what you do with the speakers than what you do with the room, right? Because in essence, the goal with the room is going to be very similar. You're going to try and reduce the impact of the room as much as possible. Um, I guess the main part of the sound is still coming from the front. And so uh, and the rest of it is what you do with the speakers, right? Yeah, I mean, we've done a couple of different iterations is that <clears throat> people like the 67 and a half inches uh, from tweeter to tweeter of the positioning ensemble, and they don't want to go wider. And <clears throat> we've done it where it's wider, like 78 inches. So it's a, a wider image. Um, and, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it sounds great either way. Um, so... Um, yeah, we'll just see what happens. I mean, but it's happening. They're driving it home. They are driving it hard. I'm still yeah. very skeptical, but we'll see. How do you feel about people using multiple monitors, especially when they oh. stick them all together? You know, have like three pairs yeah. of monitors all stuck together. Yeah. Like three there, yeah, three there. Yeah, that's a perfect, perfect uh, topic for a fan focus system. Like, why would you want more than one set of monitors when you have I one? I don't know. That <laughs> actually, you know. That's right. <clears throat> you know. Now, the only time it does make sense is if you want to hear what it sounds, you know, what your, your mix sounds like coming out of speakers. Yeah. So put them over on the side. Put a pair of whatever, Hi-Fi, NS10s, or whatever you want. NS10s are great in the kind of focus system, by the way. But just put them over on the side so you can he hear what speakers sound like, if that's what you need to do. And I've had a couple of clients do that. Um, yeah. And I've had some who had them up here, and then they moved them, and it was the same thing. Oh my God, 
you know, yeah. what are different. Um, and I also <laughs> just think from a from an engineering perspective, you want more insight into the music, ideally, if you're using different speakers, right? It's it may, it hardly makes any sense to have two similarly sized, similarly sized two way systems set up in the same way because they're yeah, they're going to sound different, but it's not going to tell you anything useful right. in that difference. Yeah, Yeah, two um, wrong systems. They're both wrong. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> two two suboptimal systems. Yeah, and... yeah. Or you could have three three wrong speakers. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're constantly they're going to constantly change depending where where they are. You know, it's all, the room is king. Well, listen, Carl. I think I think this is a a good point to maybe wrap up. It's been super interesting. Thanks for taking the time sharing with me, sharing with us. Thanks again. Thank you, Jessica. All the best.